I kept hearing the same theme come up over and over again, which is I have all these people who show up to work every day and their fingers on keyboard nine to five, like typing, do you doing work? I have no idea what they're actually doing. All I can observe is the input and the outputs. And that kind of institutional knowledge walks out the door every day at 5 p.m. And I got hope it comes back and I have no way of solving this. And so I kind of flipped from saying like, gosh, someone should solve this someday to like, why is nobody solving this right now? And I just became really obsessed with this problem. Welcome to the Startup Field Guide, where we learn from successful founders of high-growth startups how their companies truly found product market fit. I'm your host, Sandhya Hegde, and today we'll be diving into the story of Scribe. So Scribe makes it really easy to share how you do your work by automatically creating the documentation around it. They recently raised a Series B round and have grown to millions of users with enterprise customers like Gong, LinkedIn, and Shopify. Joining us today is Jennifer Smith, the CEO and co-founder of Scribe. Welcome to the field guide, Jennifer. Thanks so much. I'm happy to be here. So you started Scribe five years ago now, a little more than 2019. I would love to go back to that moment and really kind of dig into, you know, how did you and Aaron end up starting this company? What was your, what were your past experiences that kind of gave you the motivation and maybe even the insight that eventually led to Scribe? So I'm, I'm going to tell you the story, but I'm going to caveat it with uh, one of my favorite Steve Jobs quotes, which is you can connect the dots, but only when you look backwards. So right. I'm going to make it sound like it was this wonderful predestined thing that we were going to find right. each other and solve this problem. It is not how it felt at all as I was living my life. <laughs> I think if you were to go back and tell me at the start of my career that I would be doing this today, I probably would have laughed at you. I started my career uh, at McKinsey. I spent seven years in the Oregon ops practice there working mostly with financial services firms and tech companies. So that's a long, fancy way of saying, think like 200 days a year on a plane, going to places like Salt Lake City and Tampa into these really big operation centers and trying to figure out how to make them more efficient. Not the most glamorous work, but it actually drives a lot of impact for clients. And you learn as a consultant, the name of the game is you find the best person in the ops center, you befriend them, and you just ask them, why are you better than everybody else? And they would pull out a really thick binder. This, this was 15 years ago. Okay, I'm dating myself. They'd pull out a really thick binder with laminated pages of step-by-step -step guides. And they would say, I was told to do this, to memorize this. That's not what I actually do. I found these 50 better ways instead. Mm. And so we would pull up a chair behind them. We would look over their shoulder and we would write down what we saw them do. And we'd basically generate a new binder. And we'd give it to the leader of that op center and we'd say, here, if you can just get everybody in this op center to do this set of processes instead of those, you'll raise the performance of everybody. And, you know, there you right. go. Our job is done. And that always seemed really crazy to me uh, for a number of reasons. That was kind of the, the state of the art best practice. <laughs> and I sort of filed it away in my head and said, like, gosh, what a shame. Someone will obviously do something some here someday. And I, I kind of moved on with my life. And then I found myself in venture, and we obviously talk a lot now about how to sell software, but I got really mm -hmm. curious about why people buy software. Maybe it was the former consulting in me. I've kind of just always loved enterprise customers and, and understanding their psyche. And so I interviewed over 1,200 CIO, CTO type folks, and I would just ask them, like, what problems are keeping you up at night? Like, what do you wish VCs were investing in? What do you have budget for? What are you seeing today? And I kept hearing the same theme come up over and over again, which is I have all these people who show up to work every day and their fingers on keyboard nine to five, like typing, do you doing work? I have no idea what they're actually doing. All I can observe is the input and the outputs. And that kind of institutional knowledge walks out the door every day at 5 p.m. And I got hope it comes back and I have no way of solving this. And so I kind of flipped from saying like, gosh, someone should solve this someday to like, why is nobody solving this right now? And I just became really obsessed with this problem. I had a professor in business school who said once, uh, find the thing that you're always apologizing for about yourself and find a way to make money off of it. And for me, that's the fact that I'm like, I'm just obsessed with efficiency. Like it just, it like upsets my core <laughs> to see waste and like something happening in an inefficient way. And so this is a problem that I've just been kind of mulling over for a while. And 
I looked around and was like, okay, great. Let me go find somebody who's solving this problem in the right way. And like, let me go join them. And the kind of quick TLDR is I, I didn't see anybody doing it the way that, that I wanted it to be done or anything. They were solving it in the right way. And so we ended up starting a company. Awesome. And how did you end up actually kind of putting together maybe your initial founding team, your you know, co-founder, Aaron? How did the, uh, you know, were both of you kind of, it was right time, right place to like start something or were both of you excited about the idea? Like how were, you know, uh, thinking about evaluating like who is the right, who are the right people to start the company with? I feel like so many stars have to align for a company to get started that I sometimes look back at the the founding of Scribe and I'm like, I'm still just incredibly grateful and amazed that the stars aligned for us for this to happen. It kind of felt like sort of a snowball at the time where uh, I looked at it and said, this is what I want to be doing. Uh, this is what I would want to build. We got some very early uh, technical resources from a few engineers who said like, hey, we'll kind of help you out with this out of hide. I had an early customer who was like, if you build this thing, I'll actually use it. And so in many ways, I almost started a company without realizing that was happening at the time. I was just like, ah, OK, great. Like you want this thing and you're willing to help me build it. And so like, let's kind of connect this together and make this happen. I call meeting Aaron one of the greatest fortunes of my life. Aaron's my co-founder, and he is an incredibly talented engineer and product builder, probably the, the fastest that I've ever seen. But he's also just a, a gem of a human. And I think that's incredibly important because I spend more time with him and now our broader team than anybody in my personal life. And it's a huge source of joy to me. So I'm just going to put that plug in there for anybody who's thinking about uh, co-founders and kind of early teams. Like it really matters. And a huge source of motivation for me in, in building this company has been, you know, doing it with him too and, and just, you know, wanting to see him and our team win. But that's just a, a side note. I had gotten introduced to him through the former talent partner at Greylock, uh, who I'd worked with before. And um, I had been kind of thinking about this problem and starting to build. And Aaron was just starting to pop his head up. He had sold his last company to Google uh, and I think had lasted 18 months there. And he was getting the very serious itch to get back to building. And so when I met him, I think he got excited about the problem space. I, I got really excited about him. I, I met him. I think I, think I interviewed over 80 uh, people uh, to join. Uh, it was kind of early engineers. I stopped counting at 80. Let's put it that way. There, there probably were more than that. And when I met Aaron, I sort of instantly was like, you're really special. Like, I know you're going to do something really special. And I think this could be really fun if we did it together. Makes sense. Um, how would you think back and your best you can remember, what was your articulation of like the early product you set out to build with Scribe? I'm curious, yeah. you know, how closely that matches what you actually ended up like getting early customer adoption for. Yeah, it's it's interesting. Uh, the answer is it's fit, the, the quick answer, and I'll give you the longer one. The quick answer is it, it's about 50% uh, of what we have today, but very aligned in that 50% and the other 50% mm -hmm. no longer here. So right. we originally set up with saying, gosh, all of these people are spending this time using software at their computers and they're doing it pretty inefficiently because they don't know exactly what they're supposed to be doing. And that's a really bad use of human time and human potential. And so what if we could watch an expert do their work and automatically capture what they know how to do. And then what if we could also build an automation that replicated what we saw them do? <laughs> and so we built that and we had early customers uh, and we had some success with it, but we had two things happen. One, we had customers say to us uh, pr pretty clearly like, hey, actually the most valuable part of this two thing that you're building for me is that early part. Like an automation is great and good and, and I'll take it if you've got it. But like you helping me understand how my people are spending their time, like that's really valuable to me. And the second part was like they voted with their feet, which is they would use the first half of that software and like not the second. They'd be like, can I just keep the documentation piece? And I don't really care about that automation thing. And so that was, uh, I think, a really kind of humbling but clear realization for us that it wasn't the whole shebang together necessarily that was adding the most value. It, it was really even, you know, just that first piece. And so what we did was uh, we said, gosh, we've got to get a lot more signal pretty quickly on what people are actually going to use this for, what this looks like. We have a whole bunch of ideas, but we could be very wrong, right? How do we get 
the tightest, quickest, highest signal feedback loop possible. And that was the thing we solved for. And so we said, gosh, we got to get this thing out in the world and we're just going to release it for free and see what happens. And so we released a very early version of Scribe uh, on Product Hunt. They say, if you're not embarrassed by your first product, you spent too much time on it. We were hilarious. We, especially looking back now, are hilariously embarrassed by it. Like it wasn't connected to the internet. It was designed entirely by engineers. I mean, it was a very kind of clunky MVP at most version, especially when you compare it to what we have today. We just put it out there. We're like, let's just see if anybody cares. And it was pretty cool and interesting to see. I think in the first couple of months, we had like articles written about it in like 15 different languages. We would see kind of just like the downloads come in every day of users uh, using it, but then also sending us notes uh, with lots of feedback. I mean, some people pages of notes and I mean, rightfully so. It was a very clunky product to say the least. Wasn't even really a product at, at that time. But it gave us enough conviction to be able to say, gosh, we're going to drop the preconceived notion we had coming in and what we thought this business was going to be. And we're going to really listen to what people are telling us and what the users are saying. And even though these numbers are really small right now uh, in terms of number of users and things like that, like we just felt like there was signal here. Like you can feel market pull. And the thing that I continue to say today to our team is, it should not, especially finding product market fit, it should not feel like you're pushing a boulder up the hill. If you're like, put, if it's really effortful, like then you're not on, it's, you're not on a steep slope, you know? And, and what you want to be doing is finding a steep slope where it feels like it's being pulled out of you and the market is pulling it out of you. And so we oriented very much around like, how do we test the slope of this hill that we're on right now and do that as fast and quick and uh, most efficiently as possible? And then and, once um, you feel like the boulder is starting to like run, to, you know, go down the hill and pick a momentum and like freaking run after it as fast as you can. And walk me through the timing. So, you know, once you started the company, how long did it take you to like get that first product hunt launch out there? And who, you know, how did when you started looking at the early adopters after that first launch, what were any surprises or learnings uh, for you from it of like, you know, who you thought would be using it versus who was actually using it. But yeah, very curious about like kind of the timing of your first product launch or, you know, maybe the first product hunt launch and then the more mature GA product. Like how long did it take you to get there in your early days? It took us about a year, maybe from formal founding to the first kind of launch of the MVP of Scribe and what it is today. Uh, and then you know, from there, it was a, kind of a constant iteration. And so there's, there's kind of no clear milestone I can point to after that. But I would say after right. we did the, the basic GA of Scribe, it took us a few months still to like start to get signal from people using it because like it's not like we had a marketing team or a way to get the, the word out there. Right. And so it was really just organic word of mouth. And what we were looking for was not the absolute size because it was small. Right. We're talking about like dozens of people a day uh, at most in the early days. And so we weren't looking for size, we were looking for momentum and what the trend looked like over time, right? And so we actually watched it for uh, a period of uh, a couple months. We set a date for ourselves actually. And we were like, by this date, here's the trend we would have wanted to see. Here are the signals we would wanna see in usage, in feedback, in, in buzz and momentum and excitement. And very, and we said, like, if we hit kind of this milestone, then this becomes the crux of the company and what we're going to be doing. We're going to drop this whole automation thing. We're going to completely reorient, right? And it really was a kind of a, a defining moment for us. Uh, we didn't hit the milestones that we said we wanted to hit and be able to see. But when that date came, we looked at each other and we were like, you know, we still believe in this thing. Like we right. may not see the numbers on paper, but gosh, like I just feel it. Like I'm feeling the pull. I'm feeling the excitement from customers. I'm feeling their frustration with how limited our product is today. And that's a good thing, right? If they're calling you up to tell you how you're bad, that means they care. That means you're actually like you're barking up the right tree of a problem that, that touches people. And so we said, well, we didn't actually hit the numbers like, you know, but we're going to go ahead and do this anyways. And so we made kind of a just a pretty hard line in the stand decision of this is what the company is going to be going forward. And 
people will always say we never looked back, but like truly we never looked back. It was that line in the sand. Like I remember it, it was August 31st. That was our drop dead date. And that was it. August 31st, starting September 1st, never looked back. What were some examples of like the feedback you got around your product that was surprising and memorable for you? A lot of it was like pretty obvious uh, in terms of like the content of the feedback. So the thing that was, I think, surprising to me was in, in a pleasant way was like just how passionately people felt about it and how detailed the mm. feedback was. I mean, we literally get pages from some random person I'd never met, you know, who lived halfway around the world who like just happened to stumble upon our thing from product hunt or like some friend had told them about it or something. Right. And just kind of seeing like the level of, I think, pain that they were describing, we had assumed it was there. But I think seeing it on somebody's face or reading it between the lines and like the very long detailed email that they send you is really like the signal to be looking for. I think when you're trying to find product market fit is like, have you really hit something kind of deep? And so the things they were asking for were like incredibly reasonable and typically pretty obvious, like. I want to be able to edit this thing. I want to be able to share it as a link on the web. I mean, these are really fundamental stuff because our product was right. so, so basic when we originally released it. Got it. And, you know, what, how did you kind of start analyzing who was using the product? Like once you had some critical mass, how did you think about like, okay, who is our customer profile? What can we take away from like the early adopters who are using this? What should be our go-to-market strategy? So I'm curious kind of what your learnings were at that time and then how they have evolved over the you know next four years. Yeah, one of the uh, really interesting things about Scribe and, and the problem that we're solving is it's, it's a very human problem. It's incredibly universal problem. Like anybody who's at work and has to, use software and work with another person is a potential user. And so we, at the beginning, were like, again, we've got thoughts on who might use this, but we don't really know. And so our attitude was let a thousand flowers bloom and see where our users will direct us. I think what we assumed we would see were really strong pockets of particular types of functions or industries or something. And what was interesting to us is we didn't. I mean, we really saw that it was like incredibly horizontal and used by, and this is still true today, everyone from kind of your uh, single local accountant to fast growing startups to Fortune 100 companies. And the advice that we kind of got in the early days and even a bit beyond the early days was, well, maybe that's a great thing for Tam. That's a really bad thing for you uh, in terms of trying to find product market fit because and like directing your efforts against an ICP because you can't be everything to everybody. And so you really just need to, to pick one. And we thought about it and we kind of tried. We sometimes would sit down and be like, okay, well, so many smart people have told us. They're like, we should just pick a few ICPs and really go hard at it. And there are a bunch of, you know, kind of early lore stories about other horizontal products that picked a few in the early days and really focused. So we tried to study those and understand what, you know, what they had kind of got out of it. And so we sort of forced ourselves to the table to say, like, let's pick a few. And we could never really pull the trigger with any degree of conviction because it just wasn't what we were seeing and feeling from customers. And so we actually avoided doing any kind of like concentrated ICP push and instead said, we're really going to let, we're going to, we're going to build for the problem set. And we're going to be very opinionated about the problem right. we're solving. And we're very opinionated about the way to solve that problem because we've now talked to enough customers and understand what their workflow looks like. But we're not as opinionated about who you are because we actually think this can mm -hmm. show up in many different ways. And so it, it's very contrary to the advice, uh, and I think the way that I hear almost every other company has gone to market. And I mean, it was so extreme that I had uh, investors and just kind of people who uh, I think wished the company well and had been around Silicon Valley for a while who would tell me like, you can't do this. This is not going to work. And I kind of said to them, like, watch me. I think it will. <laughs> I think this is right. I'm going to do this and let's see. Right. I think, you know, it's really fascinating. It feels like there is a part of it, especially given it's also, you know, a, a, a collaboration problem you're solving. So there's a virality to it as well. 
feels like there's uh, there there's a lot you could potentially be learning from like consumer go to market, which is you know by definition more horizontal, less vertical. I'm curious, like how would you articulate go to market strategy, especially given that you are choosing to like not go an ICP route, you're you know going for the horizontal, and there's, there have been other companies that have succeeded with that as well. How how would you articulate kind of your go to market strategy? over the past few years. Yeah, I, since we're talking about the early days, this is another kind of important difference. We had originally started off selling top-down uh, enterprise sales. I like, oh. I love a good enterprise sale. I just, I love that motion. I love talking to enterprise buyers. We got a lot of like kind of pull and interest pretty early. Like it just, it made kind of a ton of sense. Right. But remember my point earlier, where I was like, we need to get fast feedback loops. Right. In enterprise sales, you know, those can be some pretty long sales cycles. And when you've only been around for a few months as a company, waiting nine months for a deal to close is like an eternity. And then you got to wait for people to actually use it and activate all these sorts of things. And I think at the same time, we realized too that this kind of very much lends itself to a bottoms up product. But we really came at it from just how do we get this in the hands of as many people as possible and learn as quickly as we can and validate a bunch of the hypotheses that we have. And so we shifted to go to market as, uh, kind of a classic PLG company, like very bottoms up and then creating on ramps for people to self-select into a self-serve funnel or, uh, or into sales. And that was another like really big unlock for us as a company very early on because it meant we now had, you know, exponentially more people who had their hands on the product every day and who were using it and not just writing us the really long emails with the feedback, but actually now we could see like product telemetry and actually see where they were voting with their time and their feet and what features were being used and where what the funnel looked like and all the kinds of things. I mean, you come from Amplitude, like you're familiar with this, all the kinds of things that you would then start to analyze. And so our learning just exploded uh, with that decision, you know, as did then our, our kind of following uh, users and value from the product and all those other things. Got it. Makes sense. Well, you know, maybe switching gears a little bit to like the ecosystem now you're building an automation startup, even just automating the documentation process and not, you know, the actual steps. That was the second half of your original vision. You are building an automation startup at a time where like the state of the art in AI tech just shifts beneath our feet every month or so. Um, how do you and Aaron think about product strategy in the context of like, new breakthroughs, model improvements, AI agents, like how do you as a you know leadership team stay sane and like keep your strategy aligned to what's happening outside of the scribe uh, room? Uh, I mean, as a technologist, it's like an incredibly exciting time to be building. I think when Aaron and I set out, you know, five years ago to do this, we just we never imagined that we would have the tools that are available to us today to be able to solve this problem. And uh, and it's changing, you know, like seemingly it feels like every week, sometimes even every day, last couple of days, there's been some really exciting announcements that have come out. And so we think about it as like, gosh, our vision and mission is unchanged. But now we have way more powerful tools at our disposal. And I think there's some interesting things we can do to contribute to kind of the state of the art of that as well. And so we've invested in that from an engineering perspective also. Um, but like, does this mean we can actually be more ambitious? I realize our original uh, kind of goal and aspiration sooner. And so it's like incredibly right. exciting. And I think it's such a privilege to be building in this particular era, just given everything that, that's going on. And I think we'll look back on this time in the way that we do kind of like at the birth of the internet or cloud or mobile and just be like, gosh, what an exciting time to, to be alive. I think anybody who claims to have a crystal ball right now to understand like how the world's going to look in five or 10 years and exactly how we're going to use this is you know, maybe a far smarter person than I can fathom, or certainly than I am. Uh, so I think there's a ton of uncertainty, but you know what startups thrive in? Uncertainty, right? And uncertain times and ambiguity and moving targets. That's like, well, that's what startups are, are built for. And that's in many ways their competitive advantage. And so, uh, you know, if you're a technologist building in this time, like, I think you kind of just have to be excited. I don't know how you could feel anything else. And so 
you know, how do you think about that second half of your original vision today with, you know, all the new superpowers that tech infrastructure is giving you? Yeah. Uh, I mean, certainly the promise of having a high fidelity automation is, you know, much, much, much closer now than it was back when we were building, you know, RPA, you know, was kind of the state of the art at the time. And there's a lot, there's great things that has done. There's a heck of a lot of limitations to it as well. And I think what's really interesting about what there are many things that are interesting about what's going on right now. But I think one of them is thinking more about like, what does a human interaction component of it look like? If you think about RPA, for example, a lot of it was just sort of like under the hood, you know, it was mostly right. unattended automation. Like you're doing this thing, not a good use of your time. We're going to have somebody code up a bot and just take it away from you. And then you never have to see it or think about it. And by definition, those end up ended up being like pretty low value tasks. Now, maybe they're done at incredible volumes, particularly in really big companies. And so the cumulative value is quite high. But the value to kind of any individual worker, maybe it just means you didn't have to do that annoying thing a few right. times, right? You know, now we, we look at our users and, and even like was it nine months ago, we surveyed them and asked them like, how are you using AI tools like ChatGPT? And like, and, and a very good percentage of them were using it daily. And this was a while ago before we even had some of the advances that we've got now. And so I think it's radically changed in how much it's um, present and at the forefront of what it means to be a knowledge worker, like sitting down at your computer to do work and the tools that are available to you. And so that's a very different paradigm. And, and I get quite excited about that because the crux of Scribe has always been about how do we make it so humans spend their time on human tasks, on high value tasks, and how do we help humans be better at the things they do, at the things that are uniquely human? And that's really what like AI and a lot of the assistants that we're seeing now are, are geared toward. Um, and again, I didn't think that I would see that this right. soon in my life. And so it's just like incredibly exciting for me to be like at the helm of a technology company that's trying to think about how to make the lives of knowledge workers better and to feel have what kind of feels like these like wonderful gifts drop from the sky that we can now build upon and improve upon based on what we see. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us today, Jennifer. This has been uh, very inspiring. I'm so excited for Scribe and you know, a lot to learn from, especially I think your uh, story around figuring out what you want to work on, what's authentic to you as a founder and how to build your early team and who to work with. Uh, I certainly took a lot away from it. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. You've been listening to the Startup Field Guide with Sandhya, an unusual ventures podcast. Stay connected with us by subscribing to the show in your favorite podcast player. If you liked what you heard, please rate our show and help us reach more aspiring founders with lessons on how to find product market fit. Thanks for listening. Until next time.